Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be joining us from. Thank you for joining us today for the U.S. public launch of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, Education at a Glance Report. Each year, the OECD Education at a Glance Report provides information on the state of education around the world. It provides data on the structure, finances, and performance system performance of education systems across OECD countries and a number of partner countries. For those of you who may be interacting with CCSSO for the first time, we are a nonpartisan nationwide nonprofit organization that serves the K-12 leaders of every state and territory. Today, we are joined by Peggy Carr, Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics in the Institute of Education Sciences of the U.S. Department of Education. Dr. Carr formerly served as the Associate Commissioner of the Assessment Division for the National Center for Education Statistics, a role she held for nearly 20 years. In that role, she was responsible for national and international large-scale assessments, and most notably, managed the administration of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, commonly known as NAEP. Prior to NCES, Dr. Carr served as the Chief Statistician for the Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education. Dr. Carr is a published researcher in the field of student achievement and equity. She has over a decade of experience teaching graduate level courses in statistics and research methodology. Dr. Carr will kick us off today by providing remarks about the importance of the Education at a Glance report from the U.S. perspective. Thank you, Dr. Carr, for getting us started with that perspective. Thank you, and thank you for the nice introduction. The U.S. Department of Education houses NCES, the National Center for Education Statistics, as the arm for uh, education statistics for the U.S. and our picture, our portrait across uh, the world. We're charged with collecting, reporting, analyzing, and disseminating statistical data as it relates to the condition of education in this context. And that includes uh, the EAG or the Education at a Glance, which uh, was published uh, for the first time in 1992. The annual publication of EAG, as we, calls it, we call it, puts educational <clears throat> and economic outcomes in the United States within a global context that helps researchers, policymakers, and the public understand how the U.S. compares to its peers internationally. This type of data is more important than ever in an increasingly global society. We are proud of the fruitful and long-lasting relationship with the OECD, which has enriched our understanding of education around the world. And we are privileged to support our colleagues at the OECD each year as they work to produce the EAG, the most comprehensive report, I would say, on the condition of education globally, worldwide. In the United States, the international studies and assessments are a part of an overall system of education data. And each component of that system, national, international, and state data provided a different, but hopefully complementary perspective on educational progress in our country. Without any of these pieces, we don't have a full picture of education in America. And the different perspectives that they provide, well, they allow us to triangulate our data on educational progress. When we see indicators from the international and national assessments moving in the same direction, well, that's reinforcing. But when they differ, then it that is something that we need to pay attention to as well. Seeing those differences can help us identify and isolate areas of improvement. High quality, reliable, trustworthy data are the foundations for this system. That is why the U.S. strongly supports the EAG initiative to enhance the technical quality of international data by reporting standard errors for selected data topics. 
We also promoted efforts to gather and report subnational data and in international studies. And of course, for the US, uh, by that I mean uh, state data. These are areas that can mass uh, variations within uh, countries. I am sometimes asked, well, what, what have we learned from these international studies? What do we get out of comparing ourselves to uh, other uh, economies when we are a heterogeneous country like uh, the US and there are other smaller, more homogeneous countries? What, what can we see? Well, we get a lot out of these studies and this compula compilation, particularly when we see and look at them in conjunction with other data produced uh, by NCS, well, we see uh, a fuller picture. So before I turn this over to Andreas, well, I wanna uh, highlight for you today three notable findings included in this year's e, uh, EAG, Education at a Glance. First, early childhood. The U.S. has lower early childhood enrollment than its peers. In 2022, the, e, uh, the OECD uh, average for uh, enrollment of three to five-year-olds was about 80% compared to 60% of three to five-year-olds in the United States. We're just now nearly uh, back to the pre-pandemic levels for early childhood enrollment. And there is a great deal of state level variation in the three to five year old enrollment in the United States, ranging from 40% in North Dakota to 82% in Washington, DC. This clearly is an area where the United States stands apart from the OECD average and where we have room for improvement. Two, teacher attrition. That is, teachers leaving the profession or retiring. The U.S. is in the middle of the pack. Relatively speaking, overall, according to the OECD data. Although uh, the EAG does not report subnational data on teacher uh, attrition, a recent NCES uh, survey, you might know it, of it, uh, the teacher follow-up uh, survey from the NTPS found that between the 2021 and the 2021-22 school years, the percentage of teachers leaving the profession ranged from 4% in Wisconsin to 17% in Vermont. And we know from our NCS School Pulse panel, we name it SPP for Nick, for a nickname, well, this survey fielded in March uh, showed that public schools were expecting to have a full, uh, expecting to have a full vacancies in certain areas bef uh, before the start of the school year, but expected vacancies reported by 58% of public schools for general uh, elementary <coughs> positions, 52% of schools for special education, and 34% of schools for math and 33% for schools for English language uh, arts. And finally, I would draw your attention to the data on education spending. This is one area where the EAG includes subnational data for some countries. In the United States, there is variation among uh, states in terms of spending uh, per uh, full-time equivalent students. And interestingly, several other countries with uh, available sub-national uh, data, spending data, these data also have a wide range of spending per student. In the US, we recognize education spending is robust and has not always, unfortunately, aligned with expected school uh, outcomes or student outcomes. In addition to, uh, to uh, these findings, the state level data presented in the EAG, NCS also reports district level finance data and recently began uh, collecting school level finance data in conjunction with our Office for Civil Rights. With these data, researchers and policymakers will be able to examine school funding equity within and across school districts. So in conclusion, as always, I'm looking forward uh, Andreas, to your presentation today. 
and continued cooperation with OECD and the EAG and other uh, endeavors across PISA and PIAC and TALIS. These are important studies to us all. And I sincerely thank the Council of uh, Chief State School Officers for convening this event today, inviting uh, me on behalf of NCES and the U.S. Department of Education. We have learned a lot from our international partners over the years, and I am eager to hear what uh, we, will, we will learn today from our Andreas and his view of these data. I look forward to uh, what uh, I have always thought of this enlightening and fruitful discussion around this report. I would like to end by expressing my appreciation for the group of OECD staff and member uh, countries whose dedication and cooperation are instrumental in creating comparable, timely, and useful data like this particular report. Policymakers depend on these kinds of data, and researchers rely on the way that we work together to improve education outcomes for our students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peggy. Um, we appreciate uh, you joining with us today. Now, joining us to offer an overview of the Education at a Glance report is Andrea Schleicher. Andrea Schleicher is the Director for Education and Skills at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, again, OECD. He initiated and oversees the Program for International Student Assessment, also known as PISA, and other international assessments that have created a global platform for policymakers, researchers, and educators across nations and cultures to innovate and transform educational policies and practices. He has worked for over 20 years with ministers and education leaders around the world to improve quality and equity in education. Mr. Schleicher will present an overview, and then there will be time for Q&A following the presentation. So please use the Q&A function uh, to ask your questions, and we'll uh, address those later. Uh, Andreas, thank you for joining us, and I'll echo what Peggy, Peggy said, which is uh, we're so uh, excited to see all the things that you can show us on this report. No doubt, a lot of charts. Thanks so much, Carissa, and uh, it's a pleasure to join you, and uh, thanks for uh, supporting this. And I also want to thank uh, Peggy and her team. In fact, uh, it was the United States that launched Education at a Glance many years ago in the middle of the 1990s. It was my very first job at the OECD. So uh, it has a long, long history and it's it's come along um, uh, quite a bit. Um, let me just see that I can share my screen. Um, to, and you should see it now. Uh, I want to start with an area where we actually have seen uh, quite significant progress. When you look at the share of young people, 25 to 34 year olds, who do not have a high school degree, no? or we also include the GED in the United States, we are very generous in the definition of that, but people who do not even have that baseline level are at a very serious disadvantage in today's economies. And you can see these are the figures for 2016. And when you look at 23, in most countries they have you know, decreased significantly. Look at Turkey, look at you know, Costa Rica, Mexico, South Africa, very significant progress in just a few years, equipping more people with the kind of baseline skills. Now, the United States has a strong history in that, you know, not surprisingly, as most advanced economy, but as you can see, many countries are now catching up uh, with this. Now, another area where we have seen enormous progress is in the share of women with at least a bachelor's degree or something equivalent. Now, you can see this is the picture among young people, 25 to 34 year old. And uh, this is the picture among olders, 20, 55 to 64 year olds. And you can see in many countries, the share of women has doubled. You can look at, you know, <coughs> South Korea. Um, and it, it was 16% among older women who had a bachelor's degree and it is 54% among young women. Now, so uh, very impressive progress creating a more level playing field, creating gender parity in uh, educational uh, participation and outcomes. No. An area where we have seen little progress is upskilling and reskilling. You know, these days everybody talks about the need that we need to upgrade our skills to be ready for, you know, new jobs. And we actually see very little movement in that area. No. 
Uh, you can see, for example, adult participation rates in 2016 uh, very similar to what we see in 2022. Now, even in countries with more progress, you know, the country with the largest progress is Germany. Here, it's only eight percentage points that we actually see rising adult participation rate. Now, this is an area where we need to move the needle. Now, the, otherwise, we are going to see increasing intergenerational kind of disparities. In fact, you know, when you uh, look at why people do not continue to learn in their adult life, over 70% of adults say they don't see a need to participate in adult learning. Now they think they have all the skills they need for their job because sometimes they don't look to tomorrow's jobs. And in Bulgaria, you know, Lithuania, Germany, and France, it's over 90%. Unless we can reverse that trend, we're going to see a rising intergenerational gap in skills uh, with older generations increasingly uh, left behind. Uh, the consequences of unequal educational opportunity risk to polarize not just our economies, our societies, our democracies. And this year's edition of Education at a Glance looks at the link between, uh, you know, skills, jobs, and lives uh, in great detail. Now, for a start, you see that older people without a high school degree are much more likely to be out of the labor market now. Uh, then, you know, people with advanced qualifications, uh, a tertiary qualification, university or, you know, associate degree or, you know, things that go beyond, uh, you know, school is a great protection against, you know, being out of the labor market. You know. Money uh, for a start, ed education and earnings are very closely linked on the right side here. You see a significant share of university educated workers who earn more than twice the median. Now, in Mexico and Costa Rica, that's over half of workers. Now. On average across OECD countries, it's still a quarter. Now. And at the other end of the spectrum, the share of workers without a high school degree who earn less than half the medium salary is over a quarter as well. You can see actually also in the United States, the bar is pretty low. Now. So you can see basically those who do not have a baseline qualifications are at a very high risk to end up with a very low kind of salary. You can uh, translate uh, the earnings benefits into dollar terms, and you can see an American man with a degree earns $700,000 more than someone without a degree. No, that's a big, big earnings advantage. That's over the working life. No. In Sweden, that's at the other end of the spectrum, it's still $130,000. That's far more than what you would invest in a degree, particularly in a country like Sweden, where university studies are free. So in every country for which we have data, the benefits of advanced qualifications far outweigh the costs. And I'm saying this because, you know, in the United States, there's a lot of debate, you know, is it really worth having a college degree? Well, you know, it may not be worth for everyone, you know, averages always hide a lot of variation, but on average, you have a huge advantage from getting a better qualification. We should never underestimate this. And those advantages have helped. You know, some people predicted, you know, more and more people go into college. Maybe one, one day we will all have a university degree and earn the minimum wage, you know, but it hasn't happened. Actually, you know, the earnings advantage have been pretty, pretty stable in the US. And, and elsewhere. Now you may look at this chart and think, well, you know, higher education in the US must be great. You know, the earnings advantage is very strong. That's not what you can read into this chart because there are lots of demand and supply factors entering into this. The reason why, you know, earnings advantages are very low in a country like Sweden is essentially because uh, people pay very high taxes. No? They don't pay tuition, but later on, if you earn a lot of money, you pay a lot of taxes now. And so basically that's what then depreciates your earnings. So you need to factor lots of things into that. The message here is more that education really pays. Now, how do you pay for that? Now, you see that students in the United States pursuing a degree pay a lot of tuition. It is very expensive. Uh, it has a high return but also high costs. And that, you know, creates a risk for young people pursuing studies. No? Again, Swedish students or Norwegian or Finnish or Denmark, Danish or German or French students, they don't pay tuition. 
uh, they recuperate, you know, the, the government recuperates the money later through higher tax payments. So that's, I think, something to keep in mind, but uh, it's clear, you know, high levels of tuition can pose barriers for students. You know, they can work against equity, they can work against access. Now, so some countries provide, you know, public grants or scholarships or government guaranteed private loans. Uh, other countries provide public grants and scholarships only. And yet others, you know, guaranteed private loans, you, know, you can add it all up, then it gives you kind of a sense of the degree of student support. Now, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, I highlighted already, you know, are countries that don't charge tuition. They still provide students with a lot of financial assistance. Now, the government has figured out, you know, it's actually a good investment for taxpayers to put a lot of, you know, resources into getting more people this is mainly about living costs. Now, there's no tuition. What you see here in the length of the bar is basically subsidies for living costs, very high subsidy. And the idea is, you know, it pays off for all of us. Now, Australia, the United States, New Zealand, Lithuania, England charge tuition, sometimes a lot, but then they give students access to financing, often in the case of, you know, income contingent loans or means tested grants. You can see that also in the United States. Even though, you know, if you ask me, the systems of England, Australia, New Zealand are, you know, pose less of a risk for students. You know, you just get that money from the government. Everybody gets that guaranteed access if you're qualified. And, you know, you only pay back your loans when you earn above a certain threshold. I think those systems are better than what you have in the United States, where it's just, you know, a government guaranteed commercial loan. So I think those countries have doing being better in the risk. But then you have a whole group of countries that you know don't charge tuition, that, that looks fair and equitable. But as you can see, there's also not much in student support. And often, you know, governments have limited resources, they can't pay for everyone, and then access is limited. So that is why some of the countries with no tuition have much less equitable access to higher education than a country like the United States. Still, you know, I think we can do better with our student support systems. Uh, what you can see here that financial support is often not targeted at the students most in need. For example, you see that the share of subsidies um, that is contingent on social background, I marked that here in red, for many categories is still quite small. Now our you know, uh, support systems are not very well aligned with, with the needs of, of people. Let me go to the other end of the spectrum. Peggy already mentioned that if we want to build a level playing field, starting early is very, very important. And you can see here that enrollment in the early years is still uneven. If you look among, you know, the three-year-olds, you can see the figure for the United States is quite low, you know, uh, as low as, you know, in Indonesia or in Mexico or in Argentina. Uh, so this is clearly an area where you know, the United States has uh, a lot of room for improvement. If you go to four-year-olds, uh, the figure is higher, but it's still one of the lowest in uh, OECD. In many countries, actually, this is an area where we have seen very significant investment over recent years. I think what economists have figured out that uh, you know investing in the early years has the highest rate of returns. You get a lot more out of this for people and for taxpayers and investing later. And particularly, you create that level playing field. Now. So important in that. Now. You can see in the case of the United States, that varies a lot across you know, geography. You know, some states with very poor participation rates, you know, some states with better participation rates. Now. So I think geography plays into this as well. And uh, you can sum it all up in a childcare gap. What this means is the period between the end of paid maternity, parental or home care leave, now that's the blue component, and the start of free early childhood education or primary education. Now, you can see on the left side, there are some countries where, you know, children have support from the day they are born. Uh, the, but on the right side, and the United States is among them, where you can say five out of seven years, you are pretty much on your own. Now, some children may still get access and support, but uh, it is largely contingent on you know, choices that people make. Now, uh, so early childhood education and care. And this is really about you know, uh, creating a level playing field. Now, uh, we also see that often you know, 
and here I don't have data for the United States, but I think it's a really interesting chart. This is the participation of children from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds and the participation of children from wealthy backgrounds in early childhood education and care in the first uh, two years of their life. And this is, I think, one of the most sobering pictures. You can see in general, the children who needed most from the disadvantaged backgrounds have a lot less access to this than children from wealthier backgrounds. So in a way, early childhood education in reality often reinforces social disparities rather than moderating it, which is the great promise there. And this is not just about access. You see that also when it comes to quality, because we take much greater care when it comes to schooling that children have, you know, a good educational focus than in early childhood education and care. But, you know, there are some countries that are doing well. And you look at Denmark, no? you can see that disadvantaged kids in Denmark have better access to early childhood education and care than children from wealthy families in, in most countries. No? So again, that shows us what is, what is possible. Um, we looked at, you know, the educational outcomes of migrants and native born uh, people, and you can see here the share of foreign born adults among all adults by educational attainment. So the blue bar is the people without a high school degree, and you can see basically, you know, half of the people in the United States who don't have a high school degree are foreign born. Now, the United States is not alone with that. Now, in Switzerland, in Luxembourg, in Sweden, in Germany, uh, those numbers are even higher. No? But it is a pretty large number. No? Uh, you can see other countries, you know, have very selective immigration policies. Look at, you know, Canada, look at Australia, look at New Zealand, no? they, uh, or United Kingdom or Ireland, now they are focusing on getting immigration largely from highly skilled people. You can, can see the green dot with tertiary qualifications. Now, in the case of Australia or the New Zealand, almost half of the population with uh, advanced qualifications are foreign born. Now, so you can see here how immigration and education policy can play uh, into each other. Now, you can see also tertiary completion rates. And I think this is an interesting analysis. If you look actually, in the United States, completion among immigrants is actually quite good. Among first-generation immigrants, you know, when it comes to bachelor's degrees, is, is, is better than among those without an immigrant background. Very different story in the Netherlands, where you can say the first generation is poor, and the second generation, the children of immigrants, don't do any better. And then, you know, the non-immigrants are doing really well. In Finland, you can say the first generation struggles, but then from the second generation, they do as well as those without an immigrant background. So you can really see you know, how, how immigration, integration policies, education policies can interact to this. Um, internationalization. Now, this is an area where the United States used to be very strong, where the United States used to be one of the most open university systems, lots of people went to study in the United States. But when you look at this in relative terms, that is really no longer the case. And also since 2013, the United States has not seen any change in this very many countries. You look at, you know, Estonia, Slovak Republic, Portugal, Germany, Latvia. Now they had similar rates than the United States. And today those numbers are significantly larger. Uh, the top performers are Luxembourg, Australia, UK, but then also some, you know, interestingly, you know, among the non-English speaking, Luxembourg is a sort of special case. Let's, you know, leave that aside. But among the non-English speaking countries that used to be not particularly prominent, Austria, Switzerland, Netherlands, no, uh, with very, very good numbers. So uh, overall, you can say more people are going abroad to study but the destinations that they chose are very different now than they used to be in 2013 or you know, even, even earlier, internationalization. Now let's get to money. Peggy mentioned already, you know, it's always you know, uh, an important outcome. And um, I start with class sizes. Now that's one way how you can spend money. And nowadays the United States is pretty close to the OECD average. Now, class sizes are not particularly large, but also not be particularly small. You know, if you want to see large classes, you would go to Chile, to Japan, to the United Kingdom, to Israel. Now, and if you want to see very small classes, you can see them on the right side of the chart. So the US is sort of in the middle. Private schools have smaller classes. You know, that's often the selling point. 
But you know, once you net out social background, our data show, generally speaking, they don't have much of a performance at advantage. It's more, you know, <clears throat> a way to uh, invest resources. In fact, you know, you look at Japan, one of the world's top performing education systems having uh, pretty large classes. Now, the Japanese made a, make a deliberate choice that they want to get the best people to become teachers. They, you know, invest a lot in the quality of teachers. They give teachers plenty of time to do other things than teaching. And they pay for that with a large class. Now. So I think spending choices matter as much as those variables in isolation. Now. Uh, the United States spends a lot on education. You know that. That's visible in primary education. That's visible in secondary education, middle school, high school. And that is particularly visible in, in university education. Now, this is, of course, you know, both public and private investment together. You know uh, that's uh, that what 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 adds up, but sort of a good level of resources invested in education. But you know, Peggy alluded to this already. There's a lot of regional variation. You look at you know, uh, Washington spends more than three times per student than Idaho. Now that's also something important to factor in. Uh, Disparities also exist in other countries. You can see in Canada, you can see in Germany, Spain, and so on, not as large as in the US, but I mean, geography often plays in and it shows that attracting resources where they can make most of a difference is, is, is also geographically still a, a, a challenge. You can ask yourself, you know, how has spending changed? And you can see in most countries, actually, between 2015 and 21, you know, uh, it's been lots of efforts to improve investment in education. You know, look to Romania, you look to Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, uh, Czech Republic. Now you talk about a quite significant change in expenditure. And in those countries, student numbers have actually gone down. Uh, that's really interesting. So the net, you know, the spending per student has actually even risen faster in those countries. The United States is sort of not seen that much change. Uh, it's pretty, pretty close to the zero line, sort of uh, the system has coped with inflation, but not, you know, seen much net uh, rise in, in spending uh, between 2015 and, and 21. No. Uh, private schools, now uh, here you can see the share of students who are enrolled in private schools. Private schools in Primary education, you can see in the Netherlands is 100%. You know, every school is a virtual school. Basically, in Chile, the numbers are high. Belgium, India, UK. In the United States, it's less than 10%. So it's not a really prominent part of the education uh, system. And actually, that has something to do with the financing. In the case of the United States, you know, most government money uh, goes into public schooling and very little pu uh, public money goes into private schooling. That's very different, you know, in countries like the, like the Netherlands or the UK, where you can say actually government pays for most of the uh, private education and that enables those countries to make sort of a, create a different environment. Now, how is money being spent? Uh, that's going to be the last element of my presentation. Teacher salaries, everybody's interested in that. And what you can see here is that, um, Teacher salaries in the United States are not particularly competitive. Now, if you compare them in, uh, with salaries of other university educated you know, people, you can say US and Hungary are not you know, paying very competitively, but it's true for most other countries, honestly, as well. Actually, generally, you know, teaching is not financially that attractive. It's a different story for school heads in some countries. You know, if you are a school head in Portugal, in Ireland, in Israel, you're in England, uh, uh, Flanders and Belgium, you can earn a lot of money. But generally, you know, uh, teaching is not that an attractive kind of career choice. No? Um, how do teachers spend their time? And this is another factor that is important. You can see in the United States, teachers have a lot less time for other things than teaching than, you know, teachers in other countries. No? I mentioned before, it's the Japanese. No? They pay their teachers really well. They have very large classes and the teachers don't have to teach many hours. No, they can spend a lot of time, you know, coaching individual students. They can spend a lot of time with their colleagues. They can spend a lot of time in professional development. They can spend a lot of time with parents. In the case of the United States, uh, the teaching load is, you know, one of the highest in the, in the OECD. And, you know, 
comparing with Peru, Chile, and Costa Rica, it's not, you know, that you would probably want to see more what the high performing countries do. And generally, they have a different work organization than the United States. So, um, the teacher attrition, you know, um, you hear in the United States a lot of talk about teachers leaving the profession. The numbers are not so bad. You know, you can actually, the United States is sort of an average performer on where we have data. You have other countries where you have a lot more teachers leaving the profession. You know, uh, the teaching labor market is much more open. So um, what you hear in the United States is not quite borne out by comparative data. Generally, you know, those numbers are on the rise, but that's true for other professions as well. You know, few people now choose a job for life. You know, many people want to change their job. And and again, teachers are not an exception. And again, I wouldn't sort of look at this in a very dramatic way. So that's all I wanted to share with you. I looking, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, as always, uh, a lot of information in a, a very short period of time. So I'm going to uh, ask a few questions and then we'll have uh, Dr. Carr join us. I want to remind the audience that there is a Q&A function. If you have questions, please feel free to drop those in there and we'll try to address them. So Andreas, let's start out with the, the policy to successful practice. You mentioned a, a couple of times Japan, class sizes, uh, a variety of choices that, has been, that have been made in Japan. Can you paint a, a, a picture for us of what that has meant and how that's translated into su some success? Yeah, you know, actually, if you look at high-performing education systems, not just Japan, but across the world, you do see, you know, they often make very similar choices. You know, typically their education systems have high aspirations. They believe in every student. You know, there is a very strong belief in the system that everybody can learn and that the system has to align resources with needs. Now, you can see really that alignment, that the money ends up where it can make most of a difference, that, you know, those systems attract the most talented teachers to challenging classrooms. You know, some do that with financial incentives, some with career incentives, but, you know, there's a deliberate effort uh, made on that. Uh, when it comes to spending choices, and what I say I know is unpopular, but whenever those countries have to make a choice between a better teacher and a smaller class, they go for the better teacher. You can see the investment is in, 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 in the salaries and working conditions. The investment is in enabling teachers to do other things than teaching, you know, the kind of professionalization, the work with students outside classroom settings. And that that is actually indeed a feature of the East Asian education systems where teachers spend a lot of time with their students out of the classroom settings, coaching, you know, uh, providing support, doing sports. Uh, the idea is that the teachers should know their students, you know, who they are, who they, you know, should become. Though there's a very strong kind of uh, a teacher support system behind that. Um, yeah, so I think actually it is not so difficult to find patterns that you can observe across the world, even though they might articulate themselves, you know, in, in, in different ways in different systems. So. Let's let's stay on this policy to practice question. Um, and one of the sections that you talked about, and, and Peggy talked about this early too, was the early childhood. Are there any particular policy to practice uh, other countries that you would point to as being successful in the early childhood space? Yeah, you know, I think you look at the UK, you know, or my country, Germany, 15 years ago, they looked like the United States, you know, very patchy participation rate. Today, early childhood education care is pretty universal. I think actually it's an area where we generally have seen a lot of progress and a lot of recognition that, you know, uh, the, the, the idea that school starts when you are six years or five years old, uh, it comes from the industrial age, you know, where uh, we needed only a few well-educated workers. And when you think that, you know, everybody should play a role, the, creating that level playing field, I think that recognition is, is everywhere. We have also seen a transition uh, from access to quality. You know, in the past, it was mainly a child care industry about, you know, parental employment and things like this. Uh, today, it's an education sector. You can see that in rising staff qualifications, uh, very clearly visible that most countries now 
uh, invest very significantly in, 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 in the qualification of staff, in building curricula. Uh, many countries have a kind of uh, zero to 18 curriculum now, where actually the early years are factored into the instructional system. So I think those are clear uh, trends. And you know, if you ask me, it's probably the area where I've seen most progress globally. Now, in schooling, you know, actually it's quite disappointing. You know, schools today don't look that different from the look 20 years ago, also in terms of their outcomes. But I think in the early years, um, we have a much better approach to quality assurance. We have a more reliable system. And uh, the only area I think that many countries still struggle with is the kind of what I call the last mile, you know, reaching the most disadvantaged. Now, that's, I think, something that um, I think still needs to be thought about. Well, let's pick up on the other side of that, which is like a trend that's promising, um, something that you see that um, you will be watching for the future. Well, you know, I think uh, <laughs> equipping young people for an entirely different world, you know, we see digitalization coming into education, both as a tool and also as, you know, what do young people learn for? I think there's been lots of you know, movement towards more applied learning, competency-based learning. I think many curricula have adopted to a, a, a new world. Um, the pandemic probably has done more for helping teachers get ready for the digital world than you know, 10 or 20 years of teacher training. I really think it's been a game changer in, you know, with a different work organization that's created awareness that has reduced or improved social acceptance of technology. I think that's a big, big kind of factor. Not so clear on the benefits. I think we see that those are still quite patchy. And we also see that, you know, smartphone used by students is not generally a great idea. You know, I think there's lots of kind of negative effect. But overall, I think technology is an area where I think things are moving, things are evolving, things are developing. Um, in some countries, I know in the United States, there's also a big debate, you know, non-academic pathways for learning have gained a lot of traction in many countries. Students just, you know, taking more ownership over what they learn and how they learn and where they learn, sometimes at the workplace and when in their lives they learn. Now, we uh, get, you know, systems like learning accounts in the Netherlands or in, 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 in Singapore. Uh, you no longer get get paid for getting a degree, but you get you know an amount of resources, and then you can distribute it over your working life. Now, and I think uh, those are, I think, quite quite good responses to the demands today. Well, let's pick up on the thread of uh, what we've learned from the pandemic and what it might have accelerated. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Carr to join us, and uh, I'm going to ask her first. Uh, you know, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, as we emerge from the pandemic, what are some of the ways the U.S. education system has been impacted for the better? Well, you know, there's always a silver lining in every cloud. And as hard as it is to uh, swallow, the pandemic did leave us with some bright spots. And Andreas mentioned one, I think technology. The use of uh, technology and teaching and learning is clearly a bright spot. I think uh, uh, our American uh, uh, students and teachers turned on a dime when it uh, came to uh, figuring out ways to learn uh, differently uh, during the pandemic and since the pandemic. And so that, that I think is sort of a bright spot. I, but you know what, I, I think the concern will be, will we be able to keep this up in terms of providing access to this technology when our funds start to, to dry up? But Nonetheless, I think uh, teaching uh, and learning has benefited from the use and access to these technologies. And then um, there's another area I would say we need to sort of, it's a related area, virtual learning. Um, the schools uh, that we have have sort of, um, well, people have figured out how to do it differently, alternative ways of learning. So virtual schools are popping up everywhere uh, around the United States. And that actually may be good for some kinds of students that have uh, issues with anxiety or social emotional uh, challenges or really just can't deal with uh, undue uh, unjust bullying and things of that sort. 
So that might be a bright spot, which leads me to another point I want to make about mental health and social emotional well-being. We really have not a focus, I think, in the past as much on the uh, overall well-being of our students as we have done in this post-pandemic uh, uh, phase. And, and we know for many reasons, we need to look at the overall mental health and well-being. But I'll leave you with one other one that will hopefully help you think about something the whole world, I think, is uh, focused on learning and recovery. Uh, in, in the wake of the uh, post-pandemic. You know, everyone's concerned about uh, returning to normal, to the pre-pandemic uh, stage uh, of learning. But for some students, this is a really bright spot because they were declining prior to the pandemic. We know this from our, our NAEP scores, particularly uh, students uh, at uh, lower uh, uh, ability levels they were already declining and declined um, worse. Uh, they were more uh, affected by, by uh, all of this, but now we're focused on recovery for everyone and our focus is on these students. Thanks, I'll ask, Andreas, I'll ask you to join in on that also. I, you know, on the learning recovery piece, on the first section that you talked about, this was upskill, so this is not K-12, but mm -hmm. you know, that that had not really moved. But are you seeing other bright spots that came from, you know, a, a, a really quick forced entry into mm -hmm. uh, a virtual education? You know, I actually echo most of what Peggy has said. I think these are the key points. There's just one element that I would add, and I think the pandemic has taught us that education is not a transactional business, but it's a social, a relational experience. You know, if you ask yourself, you know, which are the education systems that survived the pandemic best? You don't find that much of an effect of, you know, the number of Zoom lessons that students caught. You don't even find a very strong relationship on, on school opening. You know, there is some, you know, countries that closed their schools for longer, have seen more learning losses, but the biggest factor that we find is the quality of student-teacher relationships, you know, where actually teachers had that tradition of knowing who their students are relating to them. Education systems were much quicker on their feet and they were much better in during the pandemic and, you know, building that link between students. And I think it relates to Peggy's point on, on social emotional outcomes. I don't think that, you know, uh, those are new kind of outcomes, but I think the pandemic has made us aware that those things do really matter. They matter for, you know, uh, getting children into school, for motivating them, for, you know, in, enhancing learning, but they matter even more as outcomes in life. And I think that in that sense, I think that, you know, attitude of what education is, the purpose of education is really, I think the pandemic has been a game changer. And then, you know, I echo everything that Peggy has said, you know, the kind of mode of learning, the technology part, the virtual learning, I think we have seen really, I think, a, a breakthroughs in, in that, not necessarily in the technologies, but in the adoption and in the social acceptance though. Definitely accelerated uh, some of that work. So for either of you, uh, what are some of the outcomes that have significantly or unexpectedly changed from last year's report? Andreas, you pointed out some places that hadn't changed for the US in specific, but what, what has changed or maybe was unexpectedly changed? Well, you know, we look at different aspects every year. And I think the aspect uh, that we've highlighted this year is really the, you know, for uh, equity and inclusion. And uh, when it looks, when we look to adult learning, um, it is staggering in a world that requires so much from us as, 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 as adults in terms of learning that we see so little of that. And particularly among those who need it most, I think that's something that is an area that surprised uh, me when I saw those kinds of figures. On the positive side, you know, again, you know, early childhood education and care is an area where we've seen really rapid movement, and uh, the, it it shows, you know, when when something is a priority, governments find the resources to invest in that, uh, and and society is willing to, you know, accept those those choices. So there, I think there are good areas in uh, overall levels of investments. Uh, you can see that. Um, I mean. It's not just teacher shortages, generally labor shortage. It's harder to get, you know, great people in, 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 in care professions. And again, I think some countries have really been very in, uh, uh, creative in uh, building, you know, better conditions that, you know, make it more attractive for people to go into those kinds of professions. 
Peggy, is there anything that you would add that stood out to you? I mean, you you outlined a few things at the beginning of your remarks, but anything surprising? Well, you know, I want to first um, point out that this report, all as marvelous as it is, is still fairly young, and and the scheme of, of things. And when you go and you look at the indicators, there is a lot of jumping around in the um, the continuation of trend. Uh, in the indicators, which makes it difficult sometimes to discern whether things are moving up or down because we want to sort of keep pace with what is going on in the world and that might require different indicators or different ways of thinking about the indicators. But within that context, one of the things that uh, concern me, I'm going to go back to the early uh, childhood, early care um, uh, scenario that we talked about earlier. I, I sometimes refer to these kids in the uh, age three to four as our pandemic toddlers. They have really been impacted uh, by what uh, has happened here. And in the report, you'll see that there has been a drop uh, in enrollment in uh, these uh, early childhood, uh, early care centers, uh, whatever they, they may be across the United States. And we have not sort of bounced back totally to where we need to be. So I, I think we, uh, as a country, need to keep our eye on, on this, these pandemic toddlers and what, what this means for them. But, you know, I want to leave, uh, leave you with the thought of something I would love to see in this report moving forward. Um, we have seen a lot of political upheaval and uh, in, in our global uh, society. I would like to see more focus on civic education indicators uh, mm. in, uh, in this report. So we can keep an eye on what's happening mm. globally um, in this important mm. context for our world. Andreas, I'm gonna- actually, uh, actually on that, you know, it's, it's a really important point. And, and uh, in last year's edition, we had some really interesting findings. In fact, the relationship between civic participation and education was even stronger than between economic participation and education. I really think, you know, the increased polarization that we see in our economies, in our societies, in our labor markets, and in our democracies is very much a result of the polarization that we see in the knowledge and skills of people. And the economic part of that, you can, you know, handle this redistribution. You can always, you know, shift money from the rich to the poor, you know, tax policies, social policies, do all of those kind of things. You cannot do that with, you know, democratic participation, civic participation. Now, that's really the crunch where education, I think, in the future is going to be really the foundation. Well, let me go to an audience uh, question that's uh, somewhat connected to this uh, question. It was, uh, do countries with stronger education systems have stronger economies, less homelessness, less people receiving government assistance? Absolutely. I think on the aggregate, the relationship is very, very clear, uh, even historical. You know, you can see that, you know, uh, South Korea uh, used to have the level of GDP of Afghanistan, you know, uh, 70 years ago. Now it's one of the wealthiest countries. And the route there has just been education. Singapore, same story. You know, in the 1950s, Singapore was a poor harbor. And so I think you can you not only on aggregate see that relationship, but you can also see that when you look at trends over time. Now, that is on average in distributional terms, it's not that clear. You know, you can see actually, um, <clears throat> I would say, equitable societies. You know, if you go to the Nordic countries in Europe, uh, have also focused a lot on equitable education. They have very paid great attention that everybody, you know, gets a kind of decent foundation. Uh, but you have countries that have been, you know, successful on average, but see a lot of, you know, inequality, you know, both on the education front and on the economic front. And I think the inequality of economic outcomes is also closely tied to the inequality in education. But let me close out with a question about AI. Um, it's not absent from what you've uh, represented on uh, already, but um, talk to us about some of the innovative technologies like AI and how you think they might impact the report in the future, the, the factors that you've reported on. Well, yeah, I think Peggy raised that point earlier. I think AI 
you know, is in a huge source of personalization. While you study mathematics, the computer can figure out how you learn and then make your learning experience so much more granular, so much more adaptive, so much more interactive. In South Korea, you know, kids now have digital tutors. You know, they follow what you learn and then you get your personalized homework and you do your homework on the computer and, you know, the education systems, you know, tracks that as well. So I think, you know, that is one part of AI. But, you know, I also have great hopes on the equity and inclusion front, you know, um, children with special needs, you know, uh, despite all efforts, they have been badly left behind by most education systems nowadays with AI, you know, uh, think of dyslexia. You know, AI is this tool that super empowers people with dyslexia because it taps directly into where the disadvantages are of, of, of people. Now, so I, I think there is just incredible uh, potential. Um, the work of teachers, you know, actually we looked at teacher stress, you know, and we could not see much of a relationship between the number of hours teachers spent with students and uh, reported levels of, you know, stress by teachers we could see a very steep relationship between the number of hours teachers spend on administration and things that they feel are external to teaching. And that's exactly, you know, where AI, AI is just so amazing. You know, AI can, you know, make you more aware, you know, the kind of learning analytics that you can see in systems. The big issue that I see is not the technology, but it is that we do not, you, AI only works in combination with big data. You know, if you, if you have isolated, devices using AI, you do not, you know, reap the benefits of it. And this is where education systems generally still struggle. We do not know how to, you know, standardize, share, and use those kinds of data flows. There are some countries that are good at that. You know, I would say, you know, Korea, China, they have, you know, systems in place for that. But I think most other education systems, they have the AI technology, but not the underlying data systems, no. nor the kind of, I also think, you know, AI, Teacher qualifications are absolutely central to this. They, where teachers are not part of the design of AI tools, they're unlikely to help you with implementation. And AI is not going to replace teachers. You know, learning is a social enterprise, but teachers who are good at using AI are, are very likely to replace teachers who struggle with that transition. So I think getting all of that right is going to be, I think, something that we will be monitoring very closely with, with education at the class. Thank you. Peggy, anything you want to add on, on AI as we close out? Well, very little. I think Andreas made a really good <laughs> point. Uh, all of those areas, I think our imagination is, uh, is, is the limit to what we could do with AI. But you know, uh, Andreas, you and I have been on a platform before, and I was surprised you did not mention the use of AI for the development of constructs or development yeah. of indicators that mm. we we have not been able to develop uh, at least easily uh, in the in the past, such as um, um, a motivation or indicators of engagement, for example, uh, process data and the use and analysis of process data that will give us an insight into what students might be thinking about as they respond mm -hmm. to questions. Um, but but certainly uh, there are other areas as well in the. And around the equity issue, we might see some widening of gaps, I think, mm. uh, uh, amongst uh, many of the indicators that are in this report, as there might be some disproportionate uh, harnessing of uh, AI for certain um, populations than, than not. But we'll see. We should keep our eye on it. Mm. There's a lot for us to keep our eyes on. So I'm going to close us out and thank everyone for joining us today uh, for the OECD Education at a Glance report. I also want to thank uh, Andrea Schleicher, the Director of Education and Skills at OECD, and Peggy Carr, the Commissioner of NCES, for joining us. Thank you all for joining us and have a good, good rest of your day. Thank you.